guys, <clears throat> Ooh, got a frog in my throat. I have another book bite for you. I think you're gonna like this one. So it is called The Secret Life of Sam and it's by Kim Ventrella. So first I'll read you the back of the book because that's what interested me first. A dragonfly settled on the back of Sam's hand. Pa would have called it good luck. Sam wondered how long it would hang on before it got an itch and decided to fly away back home. Was it really passing on some much needed good luck? Maybe, probably not. Luck was for people who still had a pa. All right, so on the inside it says, how far would you go to be with the people you love, even after they're gone? When Sam's dad dies in a car accident, he's shuttled off to the dusty town of Holler, Oklahoma to live with a long lost aunt. He misses everything about the way things used to be. The Louisiana swamp he grew up on, the warm cans of orange crush he used to drink, and especially the stories Pa used to tell him. Once he arrives in Holler, though, he encounters a mysterious mangy cat who leads him to an unassuming tree, a portal through which Sam can revisit his old life for a few minutes at a time and be with Pa once more. Sam's visits to the bayou become stranger and stranger. Pa's old stories unfold around him in beautiful but sinister detail, and Pa is not quite himself. Still, Sam is desperate to find a way for them to stay together until he learns the bittersweet lesson that sometimes loving someone means having to say goodbye. All right, are you ready for chapter one? Okay. All right. A dragonfly settled on the back of Sam's hand. Pa would have called it good luck. Sam, not so much, not anymore. Luck was for other people. People who weren't getting snatched away by some stranger and dragged halfway across the country. Luck was for people who still had a pa. Even so, part of him wanted to keep the dragonfly there as long as he could and on the off chance that some of that good luck might rub off. The dragonfly motored its wings and Sam didn't move an inch, not a muscle. He pretended he was a gator stalking his prey. So still you'd think he was a statue. So still you'd wonder if maybe his scales had really turned to stone. He looked straight into that dragonfly's shiny, plasticky eyes, daring him to fly away. His legs twitched and his wings gave a flutter. Sam stopped breathing. This was it. Farewell to his last chance at good luck. Then the dragonfly's wings settled down, the motor in his belly slowing to a quiet purr and Sam could breathe again. Maybe his luck really was changing for the better. After all, Pa used to tell a story about how a dragonfly saved him from drowning back in the summer of the big flood. Now that was lucky. Pa loved telling stories even more than fishing or hunting down the colonel, even more than a warm can of orange crush, although Sam couldn't always tell which stories were true and which were made up. That year, the Mississippi ran wild washing away cars and trucks and even entire towns, at least according to Pa. The swamp that wound past the tiny white house on stilts, Sam's swamp, filled up so fast that the water spilled in through the doorways and burst out each and every window. Pa had been busy patching up holes when that ornery gator wiggled his way inside. Sam was a baby back then, but he recalled the story just like he'd really been there. Pa's eyes got wide when he told the part about fending off the monster gator with nothing but a spatula, his bare hands, and half a roll of duct tape. All the while, there was baby Sam, snuggled up in an ice cooler on top of the fridge, giggling and clapping his hands. Pa painted every jaw snap and spatula swipe with words that bloomed in Sam's brain like cherry red hibiscus flowers, unfolding at the first signs of light. Maybe it happened, and maybe it didn't. Either way, Sam wanted to believe. And the story hadn't stopped there. According to Pa, once that gator had subdued and his jaws were taped shut, a wave of water rushed in through an open window, sweeping him off his feet, just like his own personal tsunami. Now, Pa had been a fair swimmer, but he couldn't have counted on falling and conking his head on the corner of his tackle box. That blow knocked him clean, out and he would have drowned for sure if a dragonfly hadn't come along at that exact moment to revive him. To hear Pa tell it, that dragonfly landed square between his eyes, buzzing and twitching and running his motor, and not stopping until Pa woke up sputtering. 
Pa was so relieved to be alive that he gave the dragonfly a wet kiss on the lips before grabbing baby Sam and retreating to the roof to keep from drowning. That dragonfly had been a miracle, a godsend, a big, fat mega dose of luck. Sam didn't believe that Pa had actually kissed the dragonfly on the lips. Not really, but he believed the rest of it. Maybe even the part about dragonflies being good luck. A little bit, sort of. Okay, not that much. He let out his breath nice and slow, so as not to startle the dragonfly, then drew in a bellyful of fresh air. The dragonfly shifted again and twittered its wings, but didn't fly away. He looked out in the misty swamp that snaked around the tiny white house on stilts like a cotton mouth squeezing its prey. Shimmery blue and green dragonflies dancing on the still water, touching down just long enough to wet their toes. Pa always said they reminded him of tiny helicopters dropping in to deliver supplies, but Sam thought they looked more like ghosts, especially when the light was just right and their wings glowed like clear sheets of paper ringed with spidery bones. He listened to the water lapping at the wooden poles that hiled up the dock. Once in a while, it reached so high that it tickled the tips of his sneakers, which were currently dangling off the edge. He imagined Pa beside him holding his fishing rod, just like this and any other day, and not Sam's last. He touched the can of orange crush sitting next to him, in honor of Pa, but didn't take a drink. He hadn't even opened it. After a while, he closed his eyes. Behind his eyelids, he saw swamp monsters licking the poles clean with their long, slimy tongues. He saw the ghost of St. George himself, as in Bayou St. George, the name of his hometown, battling a dragon with three heads and rusty nails for teeth. He saw all the larger-than-life moments from Pa's story swirling in the murky water, sinking deeper and deeper into the shadows. And he saw Pa holding a flashlight to his face, eyes sparkling with mischief. Would he still see Pa when his grape soda aunt drove him to a grape soda city in a whole other grape soda state? Grape soda was the word Pa always used when Sam was around and he was trying not to cuss. Since grape soda was the Voldemort of the soda world and the arch nemesis of his favorite soda, Orange Crush. Would he still remember Pa's stories? Would he close his eyes and see his face? He thought back to all those nights sitting on the dock with Pa watching the lightning bugs twinkle over the green glassy water. Sam finished doing his homework, Pa scribbling down stories in one of his beat up notebooks. Sam wished he could go back and make those nights stretch on forever. Just him and Pa and an entire case of Orange Crush. Pa liked it warm because he said it tasted like syrup and Sam liked listening to Pa's stories that continued on long into the night and he liked the chorus of bullfrogs and cicadas that served as accompaniment. And he even liked a warm orange crush from time to time, even though to him, tasting like syrup wasn't all that great. Every once in a while, when Pa was regaling, regaling Sam with yet another tale, he'd pass the flashlight over and say, go on, you finish it. Then he'd offer up his famous gator smile. He called it his gator smile because he'd gotten his two front teeth knocked out by a baby gator back when he used to run boat tours up and down the swamp. Those were different from his other missing teeth, which were down to Bobby Joe's pet raccoon. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> you can do it. Use your imagination, Pa would say. And so Sam would take the flashlight and shine it on his face. But no matter how hard he tried, he could never find the words to make a good story. He was better at sitting back and listening than coming up with the words himself. He let out another breath and the dragonfly shivered on his arm. But believe it or not, it still didn't let go. He wondered how long it would hang on before it got an itch and decided to fly away back home. Was it really passing on some much needed good luck? Maybe. About time. Eh, probably not. But Pa would say it was. Otherwise, why would it stay on his arm so long? Sam wanted to believe, but another part of him, the bigger part, thought that his luck had died right along with Pa. Pa was the one who could weave magic out of thin air, with nothing in his belly but cheese curls and orange soda. He was the one who survived a flood, a bear attack, a whole slew of angry gators, not to mention the time he'd wrestled an escaped warthog and lived to tell the tale. So many adventures, but in the end, none of it mattered. 
Luck wasn't magic after all. It was made up, just like Pa's stories. That's the truth that everybody was afraid to tell him. Bobby Joe from the tackle shop, Miss Sarah Reed from the feed store, their closest neighbors, even mean old Aunt Joe who'd come from nowhere Oklahoma to take him away. Pa was gone, and that was that. He wasn't in a better place, sitting on clouds, singing with some grape soda angels. He wasn't battling gators forever in his own private heaven or tumbling through a mist myth mystical forest, grabbing a giant warthog by the horns. He was gone. It didn't matter how you said it. Real life was 99.9% .9 grape flavored and only the tiniest bit of orange. Luck wasn't real and neither was heaven or any of it. Pa was dead and buried. Story over. The end. Just then, the April sun peeked through the treetops and hit Sam straight in the face. He blinked away the burn, and when his vision came back, the world appeared in slices, each one bathed in that grape soda light. The cascades of Spanish moss spilling from the tupelo branches, weighing them down like crooked old men, the patched-up robot boat that Pa had made himself, and the sign that Aunt Jo had just taped to the prow, free, good to a good home. The trail of the gator cutting a winding path through the water, Pa's beer can wind chimes clanking angrily in the breeze, the model plane Pa had ordered from a catalog that they'd built together, sitting by Sam's side, the propeller spinning listlessly round and round. He saw all of it, but in a way he didn't see any of it. Just looking at it stung his eyes, even after the glare of the sun faded. How could you look at something that you'd always known, that you thought would be there even when you got old and wrinkled? How could you look out at all that, knowing it would be the last time? Ouch! The dragonfly dug its front toes into Sam's skin, wings buzzing to life. Wait, Sam said, but the dragonfly didn't listen. With another pinch, it land, launched skyward, hovering higher and higher before swooping down after some unsuspecting mosquito. That's luck for you, just some bug that leaves the second it gets bored. Sam watched its shimmering body dance along the surface of the water with the others, searching for food. Soon he couldn't tell one dragonfly from the other. Hmm, interesting. Well, it'd be interesting to see what happens with this book. So if you read this book, let me know, because when I look at this picture and I see that this is what's down under the roots in the tree, I wonder how the heck that happens. <laughs> I'll see you guys on Monday at six o'clock. And once June starts, we're just going to do Wednesdays at four. So, but we still have the rest of May. So I will see you on Monday at six. Bye guys.